Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me as always is co-host Johan Oberg. Johan, what's going on today? Good, Chris. Good. Uh, I was about to return that question to you. How are you doing? Well, I am back after three weeks of uh, had knee surgery and kind of uh, just barely functioning, barely walking, but excited to be back on the podcast again this week. It's been a few weeks away, so it's great to be back and with an amazing topic. I, I, I love talking about the future and what can be and what might be. And so today is one of those episodes which has just got me primed. No, I agree. We always said on this show that we want to talk about the transformation around this and some things that we can do today, some things we'll do tomorrow. Uh, I kind of throw it around the world that it's not rocket science. I'm not sure that's going to hold water today, but we'll see. Uh, it's going to be an interesting episode and then something that is a little bit outside maybe of my, <laughs> I wouldn't say comfort zone, but it's definitely in my, my knowledge zone. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you always say that we ask the dumb questions we're not afraid to. And, and unfortunately, I think this might be one of those episodes where we're forced to ask the dumb questions because that's about as far as our knowledge goes. But let's not speculate. Let's let's go where we're going to go. So why don't you introduce our guest and let's kick the show off. Absolutely. So welcome to the show, Sanjay Vijandran from the European Space Agency. Welcome. Thank you very much, Johan and Chris. It's great to have you on. Uh, we always say in the beginning of this show when we bring our our guests on to this one that we have met you, we have spoken to you before, so we know a little bit about what who you are and what you do, but maybe some of our guests uh, and listeners won't. So uh, maybe give us first a quick introduction of who you are and uh, the company and the projects that you are representing. Sure. So my name is Sanjay Vijendran and I work at the European Space Agency based at our center here in the Netherlands uh, called Estec. It's our main technical uh, center at ESA. And I'm leading the Solaris Space-Based Solar Power Research and Development Initiative that we've just kicked off uh, at uh, ESA at the end of last year. And I'm really excited about sharing with you our uh, planned work on this topic. So maybe then just starting with, with kind of the very high level, I wouldn't say the stupid question, but at least the high level question. Uh, we're talking about the space agency, and this is an energy podcast. So uh, <laughs> how do we connect it? Where do we start? <laughs> yeah, well, space and energy hasn't been very strongly connected in the past. Uh, that That's definitely true. And, and one of our big goals in, in uh, Solaris right now is to bridge these two communities together because we really see some, some great opportunities for the future there. Now, we have had some level of a link uh, in the past, particularly on this topic of, of solar energy, because uh, in case uh, you viewers are not aware, solar cells were uh, first applied in space before they were ever used on, on the ground. It's a space application of, of powering satellites with solar energy that, that started off the use of solar cells um, to provide electricity. And that technology in the end was uh, spun down to Earth and, and gave us the market uh, today. I, I see solar being used in space, and I think we've got a lot of things in our modern lifestyle that started in space projects that has, has brought convenience to, to us in the world. Um, you know, the air gap seems to be a tremendous gap, right? So I remember when the International Space Station went up and they're putting their solar panels out and all the excitement around all that. It was fun to watch and, and be you know interested in that. But it, it seems rather far away than, than my laptop here at, at home where I'm going to need the power. So maybe talk about high level, how this could possibly work. Sure. That's, that's indeed the, the big challenge because here we're talking about essentially putting solar farms up in space, but delivering that energy to the ground for you and I to use homes and businesses in the future. So how do we actually do that? Now, people can imagine, okay, it's a huge scale that we want to put things up in space. There's a, a huge challenge around that, but they can imagine how that could be done to to create electricity with solar panels up in space. But how do you get it down? And we're not talking about having a cable, of course, so we'll, we'll have to deliver this wirelessly. So there's a number of different ways. Um, in fact, the simplest way you can think of getting energy from space down to the ground is simply to put mirrors up in orbit and reflect sunlight from high orbit down to the ground. And there have been uh, a number of uh, studies and, and ideas out there, concepts, for putting these giant mirrors to reflect sunlight onto solar panels and solar farms on the surface of the Earth to essentially add more power into these solar plants than what 
you would normally get just from from nature because of the day night cycle and, and weather and, and all of that. So that's one simple way, but that has its drawbacks in the sense that it'll still be blocked by clouds. It depends on the, on the uh, latitude uh, that you're in. Uh, it, it is weather dependent. And so if you really want to get maximum use of uh, solar power in its purest form and have it available 24 seven, you want to be able to convert that uh, up in space into a different frequency, either through a laser, an optical laser or uh, radio frequency waves and send it down to the ground uh, wirelessly. And most of the studies in, in the past have tended to go towards radio frequency, and that's because it's a safer form of delivering the energy. You can provide it in a low intensity so that it's safe at the same time as it conveniently passes through the atmosphere with almost zero absorption, no matter what the weather is. So you really get a source of 24 seven weather independent green energy. And that's something that is just uh, not possible to achieve today in, with any other uh, source. And then what kind of scale? I mean, I watched your explainer video on the website and they're rolling out all these panels and build this big, big thing in the sky. Um, what kind of scale would it take to get to grid scale power? I mean, am I going to look up the sky and, and see low Earth orbiting you know, satellites across the entire sky and, and see them? Or is this going to be something different? Yeah, so typically uh, we are looking at trying to provide um, useful amounts of power to the grid. So, so we're talking about hundreds of megawatts or, or gigawatts of power. So supplying tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of, of homes or, or businesses. That, that kind of power level becomes useful for a, a space solar power plant. Now, to be able to provide that amount of power, you need to be able to capture so that much sunlight in space, which means having really enormous uh, structures, essentially like large solar farms on the Earth spread out over the landscape. Uh, you're putting up these up in space. So a few kilometers across some of the, the concepts uh, uh, are designed to, uh, to be in order to be able to capture enough sunlight, convert it to radio frequency and send it down to the ground. Now, these are, are humongous structures, of course, for for space, because the largest thing we've ever put into orbit as humanity is the International Space Station, which is only about 100 meters across. And we're talking about an order of magnitude uh, or more uh, than that for these large uh, space uh, solar power plants. And uh, therein is lies the, the challenge uh, to be able to launch all these parts that uh, have to be put together in space, because of course you can't launch it on a single launcher and then operate it as a, as a single large entity to be able to point uh, safely and accurately this beam down, down to the ground. Um, typically, the designs look at um, putting these in orbits pretty high up. So geostationary orbit, for example, is a good place if you want to provide 24-7 power to a receiver down on the ground, a fixed location uh, with the satellite rotating at the same uh, rate as the Earth. However, there are other ways you can think of this by putting satellites in lower orbits, um, smaller satellites and having a constellation of them, which can provide a different kind of energy service. They don't have to be, in fact, uh, the low Earth orbit is probably not the best place to put such satellites because they fly over uh, a particular point too quickly. So you don't get to spend much time delivering power before you are passing you know, below the horizon again. Plus, the orbital debris environment is is quite challenging in low Earth orbit. You've, you've heard a lot about uh, space debris that is worst down in low orbits. And it's starting to get a little bit busy with all these large constellations of, of telecommunication satellites as well. So you start, for me, this, a lot of this sounds a little bit like James Bondish kind of a thing when, when we talk about lasering down. And even though I'm Scandinavian, I wouldn't mind having a little bit more daylight. If we can fix that with some mirrors, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be too bad. But is it the actual, so, so once, once it's up in orbit, once we have deployed that kilometers of, of, of solar parts, or solar panels, the, then it's pretty fair play and easy to maintain but the is that what i what i heard but the big big problem here is is i'm going to come to cost later on <laughs> but but actually getting it up is that where you see the biggest problem if you can if you wirelessly transport the the energy down to earth again that sounds like there's some technology uh available but is it is it if, am i correct saying that getting it up into space and putting it together that is where where the challenges lie 
There, there are a huge uh, number of different challenges, uh, of course, and and they go from engineering challenges uh, to to economic challenges, trying to get the cost down for some some things, uh, to to technology uh, technology challenges as well, to be able to get the the performance or the lightweightness that was is needed. So there's a whole spectrum of them, um, starting with with the launches that you need. Because we're talking about very large structures, these are thousands of tons of hardware, uh, typically, to put, put up for one satellite. They, of course, need to be uh, produced in, in, uh, in a mass production way to reduce costs, and, and that's the benefit of the designs that we have nowadays for space solar power satellites. They're very much like a solar farm that you have terrestrially, where you might have a very large solar farm, but it's all built up of, of thousands or, or even millions of individual solar panels uh, that are that are built in a in a factory line um, through mass production. So that's one way to bring the hardware cost down. But you do need to get all of these up into space, and that will require a large number of uh, launches that need to be done cheaply enough to make the economics work out. So we've seen how people are building reusable launches now. So technologically, we believe that's a doable thing, but can we get the launch cost down to the levels it needs to be to be economically viable? Then there's the building of the structure itself in space. Now, we, we're not talking about having hundreds of astronauts on a construction site in space, putting this together by hand. In fact, that's what NASA uh, had conceived back in the 70s and, and is the reason why it was deemed not doable um, or not economically viable at that time because the cost would have been humongous. Now, things have moved on in the last 50 years with robotics uh, technology and, and autonomous systems. Now we can imagine having a fleet of autonomous robots operating in space as construction workers putting these parts together. We don't have the technology right there yet today, but we're start, starting to see the seeds of those building blocks being, being applied in, in smaller scale applications in space today, in space servicing, refueling, and all of these things. And these technologies will need to be scaled up um, over the next decade to be able to be applied to such an application. But we can see how we could we could get there. And then you have the individual technologies where you have to improve the performances, like the solar cell efficiencies, reduce the cost, improve the uh, ability of building large-scale antennas and shaping the beam into a... Uh, um, a directed beam that doesn't lose much energy. These are technological challenges as well where we need to push the state of the art. But the key thing to remember is that all of the individual technologies and building blocks for the entire chain going from sunlight to electricity down in the grid are known technologies. There's nothing brand new here that needs to be invented. In fact, every communication satellite that's been operating for the last 60 years in space is a mini space solar power station because it's been taking sunlight converting it to electricity, radio frequency, back down to, to the ground to be received back into data signals. Here, we need to do the same thing, but we need to scale it up humongously. That's where the big challenge is. But I, I guess the, the layperson question that I have is, is when you're putting heavy payloads, payloads into space, um, there's an environmental cost too, right? Is, is, does that impact the ozone? Does it impact, I mean, the whole point of being green is to be green, right? So if you look at the life cycle of manufacturing something, using a lot of energy to get it up into space, it would have to have a really long lifetime value to cost average that out for the impact of moving all that stuff up. So how, how, do, how do that, does that math work with today's technology? So indeed, that's an important question and one we'll be looking to answer through the upcoming studies we plan to do during the course of this year on a, a new reference European architecture for space-based solar power systems. We haven't done any uh, technical studies in Europe on, the dis on fresh designs for almost 20 years, but the last time we did look at it uh, in Europe, the, the answer to that question, is it in environmentally friendly to do this? Do, do we get much more energy out than we have to put in? And do we uh, displace enough fossil fuel plants to warrant the carbon that is going to be uh, emitted during the production of all this hardware and the launch of the, the, the many launches? The answer at that time with the designs we had and the technology at that time was overwhelmingly positive. Something like six to six months to a year was all that was needed to make this worthwhile doing and then be becoming essentially carbon uh, neutral after that for the 30-year lifetime that we would ex expect uh, such a 
power plant to operate. Now, we do need to update these analysis with the latest technologies uh, on the launches, on the hardware, uh, and all of that. But we we are expecting that uh, a similar answer would, would come back, that because of the sheer amount of energy this produces, because it's almost 100%, operating almost 100% of the time, compared to, say, the solar panels on your roof at home in Europe, which are operating only about a fifth uh, to, uh, of the time um, on average, delivering power, uh, you can get a very short, essentially, carbon payback time with space-based solar power, even accounting for all of the, the launches and things like that. However, it is not just about CO2 emissions, because where you emit the CO2, like in the high, the high atmosphere, as well as um, operating spacecraft traveling at high speeds through the, the high uh, atmosphere and, and production of ozone and things like that, have additional effects that do need to be studied further and quantified better so that we really get a, a good picture to understand what the imp environmental impacts are. This is part of the work that we have planned to do in ESA over the next few years to, to complete the overall uh, analysis. So in terms of um, two things, you mentioned the 30-year uh, timeline uh, for, for, for an install base. So you, you have an X amount of payback time and return the investment, so to speak, on this one, then you have the 30 year. We, we talked a lot about on the show before also in terms of electric vehicles and the recycling of the batteries, for example, as part of this whole sustainability. I would assume you won't just let them be uh, after the 30 years in space or are, what is the recycling plan or what is kind of the, the uh, around those panels after the 30 years? Because 30 years is, is coming quickly. Yes, so so that 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 figure has been used in in the past because that's typical for a, a terrestrial power plant. Uh, when you think about solar farms or fossil fuel plants, nuclear power plants, of course, are uh, uh, used for even longer periods of time. It can go to sixty years or more. Um, but looking into the future, where we are today, starting with new designs and, and thinking about when end of life for something like this might be in the twenty sixties or seventies, by the time we get to the end of of life or one of these things. We really have to think in the circular economy mindset. We are trying to be uh, sustainable. We have to be sustainable. And the idea of uh, either leaving thousands of tons of, of quality hardware in a graveyard or orbit or, or trying to uh, deorbit it and burn it up in the atmosphere, that's just not not sustainable. It's not keeping with the ethos of the, the, the future sustainable world we want to have on Earth or off Earth. So we are uh, asking our contractors in our upcoming studies to design for circularity, meaning these things should be designed from the outset to be able to be recycled on orbit, repaired, maintained during that 30 year lifetime, because we don't expect for such a long lifetime that all of the parts are going to remain in optimum uh, performance. So there'll be some level of maintenance required, but at the end as well, the recycling of this hardware so that we can reuse this material and perhaps essentially keep the power plant operating for a much longer period of time by refreshing refreshing the parts uh, themselves. Is there any risk since you're above the atmosphere and imagine some of the solar that you're going to capture would normally bounce off or be deflected. So energy that the earth would not absorb. So now you're going to be absorbing much more energy than we are today. So what kind of inherent risk is there to the planet to getting energy that may have bounced off? Is there some sort of consideration there? Do you mean the, the additional energy we're putting into the atmosphere that would have otherwise would gone not normally the... have gone in, right? Yeah, so right, have, yeah, yeah. Have so, go so, so of course we we are adding uh, additional energy into the the Earth system that otherwise would have uh, not entered uh, to be able to deliver this this power, and you might think, uh, well, surely that's making the problem worse if we're trying to cool the planet and not not heat it up. But we, we have to put the, the numbers of what we're talking about in, in context here. So the sun puts uh, 170,000 terawatts of power on the surface of the earth continuously, right? And even if we had 1,000 space-based solar power plants at a gigawatt each, we, we would be adding one terawatt on top of that 170,000 terawatts that the sun is doing all the time anyway. So it's really... 
a tiny, tiny amount. In fact, the solar cycle over the 11 years of the solar cycle, the, the amount of the variability in the sun's output is more than that one terawatt. So, so yes, we are adding more energy, but it's really marginal compared to the total that comes on top anyway. And secondly, we're trying to, we're adding this energy in order to displace another source of energy, which is more polluting the fossil fuels and to reduce the carbon output. So the effect of the reduction of that extra CO2 in the air, in, in the atmosphere that is causing the global warming is expected to be much, uh, much greater saving than the additional heating that might be caused by this one terawatt power. And don't forget burning of fossil fuels or releasing nuclear power or geothermal power extraction of heat from under the ground all of these are putting the same additional energy into the system that wouldn't have been there if you hadn't burned the fuels or released the nuclear energy because it's all going to end up as heat uh, at some point in any case so it's not really any any different uh, to those other sources in terms of uh, adding energy into the atmosphere so if we if we set aside a little bit in terms of the actual the way it works and come back a little bit to the um, European Space Agency's role in this, because I can understand from a theoretical point of view in terms of this can be done. And there's some, as you mentioned before, some research to, more to be done in order to, to kind of build the case around this. Uh, let's say in, in 10 years time, this comes back and here's the, the blueprint in order to do it. Who will actually run this? Are you, is the European Space Agency becoming a utility company now, or is this something that you're contracting to someone else? I'm just curious to understand how this, how this new technology then will actually be deployed and managed, maybe yeah. even. Good, good question. No, and so, so the, the the quick answer is no. I don't think we're planning to become a, a utility and sell electricity to um, to European homes and businesses. Um, and we're not planning to take 10 years about it to come back with the decision about whether to go ahead. We've given ourselves three years till 2025, in which we really think if this could help with climate change, we needed to start helping sooner than later. So we would like to see a decision made uh, or not on a full development program by, by the end of 2025, if possible. And, and our whole Solaris R&D effort is aimed towards getting enough information on the table to, uh, by that point to give the decision makers the the, the information they need to uh, to take a decision going forward. How we would go forward is then um, something that still needs to be uh, fully worked out. We don't see this if it were to go ahead as a ESA, uh, European Space Agency only program. It's a it would be a very large underta undertaking, both in the development and, and later on in the deployment. And it's something which ha has obvious commercial potential. And so we would expect the private sector, the energy sector to take a strong role in this and other public institutions as well beyond ESA, national governments and, and others to, to play their role at the right point as well. So given its technological immaturity uh, where it is today, um, it, is, it seems like this is the responsibility of the public sector to de-risk um, until such point where it really looks like it's feasible, but needs to then be scaled up. At that point, investors and private sector, energy sector can can all come in with the large amount of capital that they have to then scale this up and, and ultimately deploy it and, and, and make money from it. So there's a role for everyone at different points. And yes, we see it from public sector now, but it will have a role for the private sector uh, later. So we're all sitting here in Europe. Johan and I live in Zurich, and, and you're in Europe. Um, how, how is this globally? I know in your explainer video, when I go to the website, it says other countries have been looking into this. So how, how does this um, play globally, and, and, and how do you do this uh, jurisdictionally for just Europe and, and not China or the U.S. or Russia or some other countries? Is, how does this work, or does it need to be a global effort to do these kind of projects? So this is part of our um, work that we have ahead to un understand indeed how how the international cooperation scenario uh, could look or, or would need to look in order to make this possible. So there's certainly some interest uh, at, at some levels to cooperate, to make it possible to 
undertake such a big thing, uh, which may may not be easy to do for a single uh, country or a single region even. Uh, but there's other parts where international cooperation is absolutely essential. For example, safety standards and spectrum allocation. If we need a dedicated uh, radio frequency um, f- a band utilized for space-based solar power, this is something that can only be agreed at the international level between almost 200 countries. Um, reg- the, the, the whole regulatory framework so that uh, there's compatibility between space-based solar power and other space applications with, with aircraft that might pass through uh, the beam. Um, and, and, of course, the, the public uh, issues uh, of, of safety that have to be demonstrated. Um, it makes sense to cooperate on this and have internationally recognized and, and, and coordinated rules and regulations. So this is it's early days on all of these fronts. These have been identified as areas where we should work together internationally. There's been limited work so far because the topic has been relatively low profile for a long time and countries have been essentially doing their work internally. But as this now starts to become more mature and and more active, uh, active roles are being played to develop it further. It, it, the timing is, is ripe now for, for different countries and agencies to come together and discuss, okay, how are we really going to be able to make it possible f- to deploy these things uh, once we develop the capability to do so? We don't have all the answers yet, that's that's for sure. But uh, we, we recognize that there's a role for international cooperation to make it possible for anyone to be able to deploy space-based solar power. We'll need some level of agreement uh, globally to, to do it. Would you say then, if we look at the international part of this one, we mentioned a few countries and a few, both from, from a country point of view, from, from utility point of view, but also from, from institutional or, or a government and, and public. Uh, where are we in this journey? Are there are there specific regions that are ahead or uh, are there specific regions that are leading the way or are, are we kind of in the same starting point across? Um, do you see any differences? Yes. Um, so there are a number of groups around the world working on this. Probably technologically, uh, you could say that the, the U.S. have quite a, a, a good position uh, in terms of the technology demonstrations they've done on ground, but also starting to do in space. Caltech uh, in the U.S., for example, has launched just in January of this year, two months ago, some technology demonstrators for individual aspects of, of space-based solar power, of, the, of their concept. We're waiting to hear the results from from that work, but the U.S. Navy uh, has has also looked into this. The Naval Research Laboratory and the Air Force uh, Research Laboratory in the U.S. also have have a, a, a reasonably sizable program of uh, space based solar power development, including a plan to put a first space to ground beaming demonstrator in 2025 into orbit. So there's quite some work going on uh, there uh, on the U.S. side. And then uh, probably politically, um, the, the, uh, China has the, the leading uh, program on space-based solar power because they have declared some years ago that they have a goal of putting a gigawatt station into orbit by 2050 and a, and a first demonstrator by 2028 uh, into orbit uh, as well. So they've recognized, it seems, that, the, that this has a value to... Um, decarbonization and the challenges of climate change and are uh, uh, investing um, into into trying to make this happen. And they've got some very substantial ground-based facilities that they have built and, and operated now in, in China, being able to capture sunlight and beam it uh, as radio frequency down to receivers at over 100 meter distance. It's quite impressive uh, what they've done. Um, there, there aren't any such facilities like that anywhere else in the world. Um, beyond that, the UK government have uh, a, a nationally uh, supported program. They've recognized at the political level that this could aid with their net zero goals as well, so that they have a, a national program that they're putting some funding in. Uh, but at the same time, they're part of the European Space Agency and are also supporting the Solaris effort through through ESA. Japan and Korea are uh, also interested uh, in, in this topic. Japan have been working for quite quite a few years on space-based solar power at a low but steady steady level on the, uh, on, the on the technology so there's there's 
a reasonable amount of work uh, going on, but it's not at a really intensive pace, arguably at, at the pace it should be if this is really going to have, try to contribute towards our our decarbonization goals um, in the in the short time that we have. So uh, we we certainly see uh, value in in all of these countries upping upping their game uh, to to be able to move the whole field forward. You mentioned earlier in the conversation that we have the components basically to do this. There were some bits and bytes that you said that needed to maybe get developed. So the technology to basically have this, in your opinion, is here today or within line of sight? Is that what I heard you say? Yes, I think the the building blocks of the technologies are, are all there. It's about pushing the uh, performances or bringing the cost down or, or making things a bit more lightweight all with the intention of making this really more economically feasible than technically feasible. Because it, this is something that could be built in the near future. Um, it just would take us uh, a lot of money, a lot of launches. It'd be very heavy, uh, probably. And the amount of energy we'd get at the end for the cost that we would have spent wouldn't make it you know, worthwhile to affordable for anyone to buy that energy. So we're in the situation really of uh, understanding what how, how to make this work, but not having quite all the tools in the toolbox to make it work in, a, in an effective way such that it's worthwhile doing right now. And that's the really the, the core of the technical work we have ahead of us is to see to what extent we can improve the efficiencies, we can reduce the cost of the individual elements, we can reduce the mass of the individual elements uh, such that when we put it all together, we can get a, an overall system that is uh, worth doing from a from an economic perspective, and and of course, you know, technically we can we can control it uh, safely and accurately, and 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 all of those things. But that's, in my view, less less of the the big challenge than to to really bring the the economics into into the realms where where it makes it a, a competitor alongside the other other sources. And you mentioned timelines. Uh, you, you mentioned China 2050 with the first test in 2032, if I, if I heard it correctly. Where, where do you see this in terms of, um, for, from a European point of view? Uh, you, you, your study was 25 uh, uh, for at least presenting something, but, but where, where are we in terms of timelines? Was this a feasible timeline for in Europe to have something, at least a pilot test? So, um, so, so Solaris is to take us to uh, the end of 2025, by which point we hope to have enough information to be able to put forward a uh, larger proposal on a full development program in Europe. If we do have a decision at that point to, to go full steam towards development of a, of a commercial capability, that would be a, a step-by-step uh, approach through some sizable in orbit demonstrators before we get to a full commercial capability. It's 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 in our view too large to to to, to jump into trying to produce a gigawatt scale uh, station as your as your first uh, in your first attempt. So we see in our roadmap a first subscale demonstrator, perhaps in the hundreds of kilowatts or even a, a megawatt scale of, of power in 2030 as the first step. If we have a decision in 2025. And then if that were to work, we would then have a pilot plant supplying something like 100 megawatts of, of power, um, which is you know use, commercially usable amount of power uh, in the mid 2030s, and then taking, taking us eventually to the late 2030s for a gigawatt scale system. So gradually scaling up and, and demonstrating that all of the key um, capabilities are, are in place. That's, that's on a kind of let's say business as usual time frame. Um, if the political will was there and the funding was put to it to make this happen faster, that that could be perhaps squeezed by a few years to try to get something fully operational at gigawatt scale by the mid 2030s. And then you'd have to scale up after that because of course, one solar power satellite is no use to to anyone, uh, we need to have a fleet of these. We, we have today 100 uh, nuclear power stations in Europe at a gigawatt scale and, and 300 coal power stations. So, you know, power stations for a region like Europe, you're talking about large numbers to, to provide a, a good fraction. So the same thing with space-based solar power, our studies last year showed that if we we're gonna provide something like 10% 
of Europe's future electricity needs in 2050, we'd need anywhere between 30 and 50 or so of these satellites, each at a gigawatt scale. So scale up, having the time to scale up is important as well. It's no use having the first one in 2049 and hoping to hit net zero by 2050 uh, and contribute to that. So that's why we've given ourselves, the, you know, 2040 is really the last point to have the first system uh, proven. And then you'd need to rapidly duplicate these and, and put them into, into orbit over the next decade. So do you see competing factors? I mean, if I look at the billionaire space race, you know, where they're building, you know, things to get into orbit and things, are you competing with folks trying to get to another planet or another destination for humans? Or are you just competing with dollars for energy on Earth? Like, where, who are you competing with? Where are you taking resources with to make this happen by those timelines? Well, space-based solar power certainly has in-space applications as well as, as, as the space-to-Earth applications. So there's, there's a lot of interest in developing this capability to support further uh, exploration of space as well. Um, and the good thing is that those um, folks who are working on uh, developing in-space applications are, in any case, advancing some of the key technologies that will be needed for the space to to ground uh, applications so we can we can piggyback on those investments because the scale of the space to earth application is so so large and, and challenging we're talking about gigawatts of power uh, that not everyone is is con convinced that this is something to be invested in uh, right now but there's a lot of interest for providing it say for power on the moon or, or to mars or other planets at much lower power power level um, but we're trying to really focus this as, as something that uh, can potentially support climate change decarbonization so the the the, the competition or, or, the, or the or the funds that would go towards scaling this up for that application is is within the energy sector within the governments who have huge amounts of budget now being put towards uh, decarbonization rollout of renewables um, and and also development of alternative renewable technologies like uh, geothermal or wave energy and um, uh, nu nuclear fission, nuclear fusion in the longer term, but the governments are investing in all the full range of future possible clean sources as they should be, because we don't know which one is going to, in the end, work out to be uh, be the best. And it won't be a single one uh, as well that contributes to our future energy mix. It's going to be uh, a bit from from uh, lots of different sources. So, so that's where we think. Uh, a, a relatively small fraction of what is already going into and being planned for the energy transition over the next uh, three decades, if it were to be put into developing a potentially game-changing new source, this, this would make a sensible and worthwhile investment uh, to see if this could be could be realized. Which, which I, I think that is so fascinating. And, and as I said from the beginning, I have limited the experience of this one and it felt a little bit like the James Bond movie in the beginning. But you, you really put clarity on, on a number of things. There's a lot of work to be done, but but I think it's a, it's a very interesting journey ahead. And as you, I think you, you, you piggybacked on a few times as well that making sure that you know the technology is actually here. We need to tweak it. We need to make sure that we can expand on it and, and obviously then uh, get it up into space. But it, it's built on something that we've done. And that always mm -hmm. encouraging to me because we we discussed with other um, parts of the show and, and aside from the show where it's, it's more kind of uh, blueprinting, testing something that might work, that could potentially work with a big P for potential. So I, I think this is, it was really, really interesting. But I know we're coming up with time, but maybe a little bit more flavor or to speak on on the this ecosystem we, we talk a lot about this ecosystem around uh, around the energy transition not just for the utilities and also the investment um, who else are in the solaris project is this purely uh, for for the um, european space agency or are they are you already collaborating with with others on the specific project so um We've been very conscious that this needs to um, to get out of the space industry where it's been residing for uh, too long um, and really into the energy sector's um, sphere of, of operation. They've, they've not thought about energy coming from anywhere else than planet Earth so far for Earth needs. 
And that's something that we're trying to change some, some mindsets and have people look a bit more broadly and recognize that there is an energy resource, a wonderful one, our sun, that is providing its best resource up there in orbit. We simply need to go up and get it and, and, and bring it back. And there's a huge amount of benefits for for, for doing that. So we're, um, we have been in discussion uh, while preparing Solaris to understand the energy sector's view about this. Uh, our experience is that almost no one has heard about it until we've brought it to their attention. But after having just an hour's conversation like this with them, they're, they're all completely sold that if this is doable, this is something that they would want. This is something the world needs if, if we could actually do it because it, it offers these wonderful characteristics. So uh, it is something that we need to uh, prepare them to take a role in uh, in the future. And we're bringing them along on the journey. Even with our technical studies that we're going to be doing now on a new concept, we want to get their input on what would their future needs be in terms of clean energy with a service like this so that we can design the best space system architecture that meets those future needs rather than try to come up with something and then push it on them. Um, we, we really want to have this uh, designed to, to the future needs. And so we are interacting with energy sector stakeholders right from the early on to raise the awareness, to find out what their needs are and to get them yeah, warm to the feeling that this is not something alien science fiction for somebody else, but it's really something for them. This needs to be an energy project in the future that does happen to have a large space component, but it needs to be driven by the energy sector as simply an advanced type of solar that you have to put the solar panels in a different location uh, than the ground or on rooftops or on lakes, just happen to put them in orbit to get the 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 solar the type of solar that you want that that has these benefits so it's 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 really we're, we're really trying to work with them to 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 get this awareness and um hoping that some of them might even partner with us at this early stage to get um to get involved in 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 the the development as we go it sounds analogous to the communication industry where we started on the ground and space just became part of communications so I, I see a lot of analogy there. Um, yeah. I think the journey of this call has been fantastic. I, I've really enjoyed uh, hearing about it. Of course, when I when I saw your initial post and reached out to you to join the podcast today, I was already um, interested in what, what you had to say. Um, I guess the one final question I have is, what's the biggest risk? Is it economic? Is it interest? Or what, what keeps this from happening? I think there's the... Um, it's it's the mindset again to um, to make to to bring this more down to earth that it's something that is um, doable in uh, a reasonable time frame. It's not like fusion. We believe that is fifty years away. Uh, we we have the building blocks that we think with sufficient investment, it could be done in a meaningful time frame to to matter now now meaning in the next uh, fifteen to 20 years max and, and help with climate change. And that um, we we need people to to be aware that uh, we ought to be working on it and trying to, to realize it. So uh, the technological challenges I don't think are, are the most serious, but the regulatory aspects may be the more challenging. The public perception issues, um, the um, the issues around uh, uh, safety and compatibility with other uh, systems in orbit. These are things that uh, unless we show that there are solutions for those aspects, uh, if investors themselves won't be in a rush to try to make the technology feasible, if, if it's not clear, we can ultimately deploy it. So there are uh, these non-technical challenges, policy and regulatory cooperation, that may may end up being even more challenging than the than the technical uh, part. I think that rounds it up quite well. I think that's something we come back to on this show quite a bit. That the actual technology is sometimes I wouldn't say the easy part, but it's the initial part. But then everything that comes around energy uh, is mm -hmm. where, where some of the challenges are. Sanjay, it was a pleasure having you on the show and you gave us a lot of input and this is going to be really interesting, not for us, but also for our listeners to follow more on this journey. So thanks a lot for, for joining Insider's Guide to Energy. 
You're welcome, and, and thank you for the opportunity to share on this topic. My pleasure. Thank you, and for our audience, we hope you've enjoyed the show as much as we have. It's been a pleasure to make this episode. It's pretty exciting stuff. If you find this content interesting, don't forget to follow us, subscribe, like it, add comments, and we will see you again next week. Bye-bye.